The next item of business is a debate on motion 2949 in the name of Kate Forbes on Budget Scotland Bill. And I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons or enter R in the chat function. I call on Kate Forbes to speak to and move the motion up to nine minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to start by thanking the Finance and Public Administration Committee for, for their report on the budget. Today's budget is clear in its missions. It will tackle the climate emergency, it will support economic recovery and it will reduce poverty. And it will also deliver on other priority commitment, commitments, including free bus travel for young people, non-domestic rates relief for businesses and substantial increases in health and social care spending. As I have made clear previously, the absence of COVID-related funding, despite the very real ongoing impacts of the pandemic that all of us can attest to, has meant that this is a challenging budget. And the Scottish Fiscal Commission has highlighted that as a result of reductions, the overall Scottish budget for next year is 5.2% lower in real terms. With COVID funding having been removed, our day-to-day -day funding next year is less compared to the current year, at a time when we undeniably need to invest in the economy and help services to recover. And so, as I've said before, this is a budget of choices, of some hard choices, but I believe that we have made the right choices. As I stated yesterday, I recognise the valued contribution that our local government partners make to the delivery of our frontline public services. Having engaged with COSLA and individual local authorities regularly over the last few months, I'm conscious of the challenges that they face, including the increasing impact of inflation. I've repeatedly said that next year's Scottish budget is fully allocated. That remains the case. However, I've also been clear that I've been monitoring this year's budget very closely. The UK government has spent weeks advising us that we should not expect further funding. Now, that has changed in the last few days, and the UK government has advised in a matter of days that we should anticipate further funding for this year, which will be finalised and confirmed at the spring supplementary estimates next month. As I said last week in the Chamber, the fact that next year's Scottish budget is fully allocated remains the case. But in light of new information from the UK Government, I wonder if you would allow me to finish this piece and then I'll bring him in. But in light of new information from the UK Government, I now have some new and additional flexibility on this year's funding. And so I am pleased to confirm my intention to utilise the Scotland Reserve to carry forward sufficient funding from this year to next year to allocate a further £120 million of resource to local government. Councils will have complete flexibility to allocate that additional funding as they wish next year, and I intend to bring forward an amendment to the Budget Bill at Stage 2 to deliver this. Would you mind if I just finish this piece and I will then bring in Mr Kerr. Presiding officer, councils asked for an additional £100 million to deal with particular pressures. We have heard them and listened, and we are going to go further. That will allow them to deal with the most pressing issues they face, and at a time when people are understandably worried about the cost of living. I would point out that this increase in funding would be equivalent to a 4% increase in council tax next year. So whilst councils have full flexibility in setting local council tax rates, I don't believe that there is a requirement for any inflation-busting increases uh, next year. I'll take uh, the, the member. Stephen Kerr. Thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Can she then further amplify, is this £100 million that's coming as part of the additional money from the UK Government, is this on top of the money that the UK Government already committed to the Scottish Government as part of uh, the COVID recovery money? The, the money that the SNP Government made such a great big fuss about, saying oh, nothing was certain about this, we might end up with less and all the rest of it. This is additional money. Can she just confirm that that is the case? So uh, the member is right to ask these questions. Next month, as in every year, we expect the UK government to confirm at the supplementary estimates our final position for this year. And uh, over the last few days, I have had a, a personal conversation with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. And of course, officials have been engaging quite extensively with Treasury because, as he will recall, when it came to the £440 million, there was some suggestion that some of that would be clawed back if the consequentials weren't generated. 
What the UK Government have now confirmed is that that won't be the case in terms of the 440, but the final position will be confirmed next month. But that provides me with sufficient flexibility to uh, prioritise funding for uh, local government. Um, I will take uh, uh, an intervention. Miles Briggs, Cabinet Secretary, for taking this intervention. Can she confirm to the Chamber, with regards to the National Insurance Contribution Compensation Fund, the £70 million which have been given to ministers on that, is this part of that funding, or is that another announcement we'll have to hear from ministers? So, as I said, with this £120 million, that allows uh, local government to cover the challenges that they, they face. And quite clearly, uh, national insurance contributions is a cost that they uh, have to um, uh, deal with. And so that £120 million will allow them to uh, deal with uh, those additional costs. I will take a third intervention. Willie Rennie. We're being very generous with our, with our time. Um, there still will be massive cuts for local government. Does she think that local councils should be grateful that the Cabinet Secretary has just taken the foot off her neck a little bit? Should she not recognise that there are massive cuts coming to local services? Cabinet Secretary. It, the, the member has articulated, I think, an important point that all members of this chamber have been calling for me to go further with local government, particularly in light of the pressures of inflation. And we have done that today. I have painstakingly identified additional funding from this year's budget. I haven't changed my position on next year's budget, which is fully allocated, but we have chosen out of a challenging budget settlement to prioritise additional funding for local government. And local government will be able to determine how that uh, funding is spent. And I think that is something that we can all welcome. And as the member would expect me to say, the real question will be at 5pm tonight, whether or not all parties in this chamber back additional funding for local government or not. This decision ensures that next year's budget delivers for Scotland's local authorities a total funding package of over £12.6 billion. That's an increase of over a £1 billion or equivalent to a 6.1% increase in real terms. And so it provides the best funding package we can offer for local government based on our current resources. That will in deliver increased resources for social care and education, ensuring the continued delivery of vital local services across Scotland. It is a fair settlement for local government within a challenging budget. Presiding officer, this budget recognised that we are facing some of the most challenging economic circumstances through rising inflation, increased costs and the fact that COVID-19 has had an unequal impact across society. And this is a budget that reflects the ongoing realities for many families and some of these challenges have only increased since the budget was laid. And so the budget delivers on our national mission to tackle child poverty through increasing family incomes and continuing our action to tackle the poverty related attainment gap. We're investing £197 million on our new Scottish Child Payment, including doubling it to £20 a week from April 2022. This will fund the most ambitious anti-poverty measure anywhere in the UK. I'd be delighted to, but I'm going to look to the presiding officer, um, because I'm quite behind with time, to ask if we've got time in hand. Yeah, um, Cabinet Secretary is in her last minute. OK. In line with the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecast, we're committing over £3.9 billion for benefits uh, next year. And we're also continuing to tackle homelessness, committing £831.5 million next year towards the delivery of more affordable and social housing. But, presiding officer, underpinning these spending commitments, this budget also invests in Scotland's ambition of being a well-being economy, a growing economy that enables successful business activity, entrepreneurship and innovation. It's a particularly crucial time to support businesses. And that's why we will deliver the highest level of investment for our enterprise agencies since 2010, with over £205 million in capitalisation for the Scottish National Investment Bank. It will continue to offer a generous non-domestic rates package and ensure that we support all parts of Scotland. And, presiding officer, as I come to a conclusion, this budget is a transitional budget. It's supporting Scotland's recovery next year, but also looking beyond as we build the foundations for a just transition, investing in delivering that just transition to a net zero and climate resilient Scotland. 
And so I do come to a conclusion, eh, presiding officer, recognising that the budget delivers on Scotland's priorities, priorities that I imagine most people across this chamber actually share. Priorities of tackling poverty, priorities of supporting Scotland's economy and the priorities of ending Scotland's contribution to climate change. And I commend it to the chamber. Thank you. I now call on Liz Smith to speak to and move amendment 2949.1. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and can I immediately uh, move the amendment? And can I also warmly welcome uh, the actions taken by the UK Government uh, to assist with this budget? And may I, also start, may I also start on a few points of consensus, firstly by acknowledging that the backdrop to this budget is particularly challenging. A lengthy COVID pandemic, which although the signs are improving, is by no means over. Worldwide economic trends, which due to major issues with supply chains and energy costs, plus the political dangers of aggression by Russia against Ukraine are creating serious inflationary pressures, labour markets having to cope with the post-COVID and post-Brexit landscapes, and increasing issues about forecast errors and forecast timings. The Cabinet Secretary will be pleased to know that we don't believe that any of these are within the Cabinet Secretary's control. And so we do understand why she has been keen to describe this budget as one of difficult choices. It is. And I certainly know that we can't commit to absolutely everything that we would like to do. And secondly, just pursuing the consensus for a little bit longer, it won't last, we do agree with the Cabinet Secretary on some key commitments. For example, the doubling of the child payment, investing in employability schemes, additional sums to tackle the attainment gap, which is ever widening, as we know, and maintaining landfill tax in line with UK rates. But, as I say, I'm afraid that is where the consensus has to stop, because we are very clear that the Scottish Government has created many more problems within this budget than it has actually solved, despite receiving a £3.9 billion increase in the core block grant funding from the UK Government. And may I deal with business in the very first... Yes, of course. John Mason. Uh, the £3.9 billion is, is she suggesting that some of that has not been allocated. What I am suggesting, uh, Mr Mason, is that that is a very substantial increase uh, when it comes to the core block grant, and I think that is extremely important as a backdrop to this budget. And can I deal uh, first with business, specifically the sector's very strong feedback about the future of the Scottish economy, backed up by extensive statistical analysis from the economic forecast groups. They all tell us that while there is little cause for optimism in the next few months, as we saw uh, yesterday, the longer-term prospects for the Scottish economy are particularly grim. For quite some time now, they have been warning successive Cabinet Secretaries about the inherent structural weaknesses in the Scottish economy, present long before COVID, long before Brexit, and which this budget should be addressing as a priority. The Fiscal Commission, the Chambers of Commerce, the SCDI, Fraser of Allender, they have all warned the Scottish Government about the demographic issues which are reducing labour market participation, about slower growth in earnings and employment relative to the rest of the UK. And of course, all of that has important implications for tax revenues and the Scottish budget. The Fiscal Commission has told us that the Scottish income tax revenues are growing more slowly than the income tax block grant adjustment, which means a net negative position of 190 million for this coming year, possibly rising to 417 million by 2026-27. And, of course, also noting the concerns that the scaling down of the oil and gas industry with its highly skilled workforce will just exacerbate these problems. These are serious statistics, Cabinet Secretary, and so too are the statistics about weaker productivity and economic growth. And it's our contention that this budget should be responding to them. Yes, of course. Cabinet Secretary. In a constructive spirit, what policy does the member think is fundamentally missing that would significantly deal with those challenges and what funding would she allocate to that? I'm, I'm actually just coming to that, Cabinet Secretary, but I think if you listen to what business is saying, one of the, the most important things is about the skills gap and uh, the, the, the policies that have to address what we can do to ensure that there is greater productivity and economic growth. And I think two, two things that I think we can concentrate on, we made a commitment uh, back in our manifesto that we uh, want to see 100,000 uh, lifelong learning accounts to be specifically spent on training and qualifications and also on longer term, uh, much more flexible and demand-led apprenticeships, which are a big ask from the business community. And we know too from business 
that there are serious concerns about our town centres already in trouble before the pandemic. And that's why we are so keen to see uh, business rates relief extended for the course of the whole year, not just for the three months, which is what the SNP is committed to. And that brings me to uh, local government. And notwithstanding uh, the announcement today, uh, last week the Conservatives in their debating time, um, along with Labour and the Liberals, although noticeably not the Greens, who not so long ago, with Andy Whiteman in their ranks, would have been agreeing with us, exposed the full extent of the SNP attack on local government. And what has been said by COSLA, by every council group leader, including the SNP's own, and from various groups like care workers who are on the front line of delivering uh, council services, they all see really big cuts coming. And Kate Forbes said on the 9th of December in her budget statement that she felt this budget deepens the relationship between the Scottish Government and local, uh, uh, local government, and that is very clearly not what local government thinks. Now, it, I won't, if you don't mind. I need to make a little bit more progress. Now, the SNP has quite rightly asked us what, where we would find the money. And before I say anything more, we would definitely not be devoting millions of pounds to a second referendum, preparing for independence or doubling up on external affairs. That money would be far better spent supporting business and local government. And like many in local government across the political spectrum, we're quite concerned about the setting up of a controversial national care service, which has all the signs of being an extremely costly reorganisation of a care service. And I think uh, there are many people in local government who feel that that won't work. Indeed, uh, we think that the, it's the very last thing that care workers re need right now. And I think today's Audit Scotland report into social care uh, spells out some of the biggest uh, concerns. Now, presiding officer, uh, no one believes that setting budgets is easy, but Kate Forbes has had at her disposal the largest UK budget settlement and extensive additional money for COVID recovery from UK Barnet consequentials. She's asked for a rational approach from the opposition parties for her spending plans, and we will continue in that approach. But in the same breath, she cannot explain why it's Scotland's oil, yet the SNP will walk away from that sector. She cannot say what currency the SNP would adopt if Scotland was ever to become independent, nor can she explain why she has been so harsh to local government at the very time that she claims they are central to del the delivery of more efficient public services. Presiding officer, this budget does nothing to properly secure Scotland's economic future or to safeguard essential local services, so we will oppose it at stage one. <laughs> I now call on Daniel Johnson to speak to and move Amendment 2949.2 up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I apologise for not being there in person? I'm dealing with something of a domestic Omicron wave, but by the same token, it does allow me to attest to the efficacy of the vaccine and the booster. But after two years of COVID-19, this budget needed to be a turning point. It needed to build resilience and support recovery. It needed to create jobs and build back our public services. It needed to help those who'd put themselves on the front line to care for the vulnerable and for those who'd missed on their education. And indeed, there are some things that we support in this budget. Increased funds for the NHS and they increased the child payment. But the government knows this will not be enough to meet their own statutory child poverty targets. This budget delivers neither the focus or foundation to deliver these wider needs of recovery. Instead, it offers an insulting pay rise of just 48 pence for social care workers and underfunds our councils. And just on the Cabinet Secretary's announcement, while 120 million is welcome, that still leaves local services short of 250 million pounds. And moreover, it rather seems that while Derek Sofa has been moved out of that office, Kate has found a few pennies down the back of her armchair. This is no way to construct a budget in a serious and rational way, as the Cabinet Secretary seems to seek to, to uh, 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 propose. Which brings me to the next point, that we need more honesty about the numbers. The government wants to compare this budget to the emergency COVID funding of this year and last. The government were clear that COVID money would only be used for non-recurring COVID spend, and I took them at their word and agreed with that principle. But that also means that with a 2.9 real terms increase in core funding in the block grant, this sum was unallocated going into this budget. 
Baking emergency COVID funds into their calculations not only misrepresents the position we are in, comparing a year of emergency with a year of recovery, but it also misrepresents the approach the government took as it allocated those emergency funds. Less available in total, yes, but almost three billion unallocated available to be invested in recovery. If the government were to apply the logic they apply to their funds to that of local government, including the emergency funds local government had at its disposal, that would mean local government facing a 25% cut, which isn't the line I hear from the Cabinet Secretary. But then we know this government lacks transparency when it comes to their budgets and how COVID money has been spent. That is what Audit Scotland said in July and again in September and again in December. They were also clear that it is not possible to track money from budget to announcement to outturn to consolidated accounts. This government must be honest about the numbers, but so too must the Conservatives. Using the figure of 3.9 billion at a time of raised inflation is disingenuous, and to claim that it is additional spend is simply to imply cuts on every other budget line in real terms, not cash terms. This budget does require difficult decisions, but more so because of SNP mismanagement of the economy. The Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts are clear Scottish income tax receipts are underperforming not just the South East, as the SNP tried to claim, but the UK average as a whole. On wage growth and employment growth, every Scottish region underperformed the UK average, bar one. That failure to grow jobs and grow wages does not just let down Scottish workers, and has left this government with £200 million less than if, than if income tax had not been devolved at all. What we need, is, needed in this budget was focused intervention to get people into work, to fill labour shortages, to reskill people into better pay. When it comes to the economy, the government's constitutional distraction leaves Scots less money in their pockets and this Scottish government with less money to invest in public services and recovery. Now, where is the plan to address labour shortages? Where is the plan for our cities? Where is the plan for building green industry and supply chains? What sums up this SNP government is that two years into this pandemic, they have yet to publish an economic or jobs recovery plan, and their promised 10-year plan is delayed for another day. No plan for the here and now, and a delayed plan for the distant future. It is social care and local services, however, where this budget moves from being flawed to being unsupportable. The continued decrease in local authority funding is unacceptable, regardless of what the Cabinet Secretary manages to pull out at the last minute. Analysis from SPICE confirms that local councils were the losers in this budget. Almost every single other budget line was static in its share of public spending, whereas cash-strapped local government social spending has fallen by 2.4 per cent in its share of funding. So they're looking at the real terms outli cut outlined by COSLA or this analysis, local government's share of total spend, whatever way you cut it, bells out as further centralisation of public services and undermining local services. On top of this, the scandalous pay offer of just 48 pence per hour to social care workers is nothing short of that. The reality of this work sees staff dealing with the vulnerable people round the clock and working under tremendous time pressures. And findings from the Audit Scotland report just this morning uh, underline these points and the stark realities. It outlines a lack of worth felt by each social care worker and the Im immense vacancy pressures across the sector. 36% of uh, services reporting uh, vacancies as of December 2020. That's three times higher than across all employers in Scotland, with 20% of staff not on permanent contracts, 11% on zero hours contracts, and 15% on, on work, working unpaid overtime. We need a social care se system that pays its staff well and attracts people to the sector. The question is not whether paying £12 an hour is affordable, it is whether in terms of recruitment and preventing bed blocking in the NHS, we can afford not to pay care workers this reasonable sum. In conclusion, there are of course things that Labour support. The, the needed increase in child payment and NHS funds, but this SNP budget fails to deliver for those who desperately need it. If you, you can can't build conclude, a please, Mr Johnson. I will. You, you, you don't grow the economy by underfunding local services. You don't build re recovery and reskill uh, 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 without targeted support. And for these reasons, Scottish Labour cannot support the budget.
Can I just can confirm? I in my name? Can I just confirm, Mr. Johnson, that you've moved the amendment in your name? I, I believe I just did in, in my closing breath there, Presiding Officer. Apologies. Lovely. Thank you very I, much. I, I move, though. Indeed, and I now call on Kenneth Gibson to speak to to speak on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to speak to the Finance and Public Administration Committee's report on our budget scrutiny. The Scottish Government, Parliament and Scotland face a challenging year. The Independent Scottish Fiscal Commission made clear that this Parliament would suffer a real terms cut in the Westminster Block Grant, saying in evidence to the Finance and Public Administration Committee that the overall Scottish budget in 2022-23 is 2.6 per cent lower than in 2021-22, after accounting for inflation, the reduction is 5.2 per cent. Indeed, with further declines in resource expenditure likely in the years that follow. However, we now find that additional monies will be made available. It would therefore be helpful to have clarification on the detail of these resources as soon as possible. Uh, with UK Government capital grants slashed by 9.7 per cent, borrowing to the £450 million maximum permitted is required to enable a 1.2 per cent increase in infrastructure in expenditure after inflation. It is inevitable that previous budgets and reports have focused on the health pandemic and its economic and fiscal impact. However, although still dealing with COVID, we must and are looking to the future and recovery, assessing the extent of the economic damage and how we move beyond it. The FPA Committee acknowledges the need to balance the short-term demands of responding to and recovery from COVID-19 with continuing longer-term pressures such as demography, poverty, inequality and structural imbalances, a key theme of both our pre- and final budget reports. Scotland faces structural inequalities as we move back towards a more normal way of life. To ensure our public finances are placed on a more sustainable footing, we note in our budget report that productivity, wage growth and demographic change should focus Scottish ministers. Scotland must improve its economic performance, both in absolute terms and relative to the rest of the UK. Doubtless other members will pick up these, uh, on these, and indeed uh, um, two of them already have, uh, and other issues such as business investment levels, labour market participation and skills. We face a number of risks. Inflation is rising at the fastest rate in three decades, with the worst possibly still to come. Average earnings are failing to keep up. Ofgem is expected to soon announce that the energy price cap will rise again on 1 April. The SFC point to a slow recovery in wage growth and income tax receipts as we emerge from the pandemic. The FPA committee is particularly concerned to note forecasts showing Scotland's income tax receipts falling behind the block grant adjustment, which could put Scotland's future fiscal sustainability at risk. With Social Security expenditure likely to reach £764 million more than allowed for in the block grant adjustment by 2024-25. Next year, Scotland's net income tax position is likely to be negative by £190 million, and the SFC expects this gap to grow to reaching £417 million by 2026 27 It is also clear, with UK government grants continuing to decline, it is time to consider further fiscal flexibility for Scotland. Borrowing limits are too constrained and are being eroded by inflation. Tax rates remain unchanged, but as in the rest of the UK, inflation will bring more people into higher bands through fiscal drag, while UK increases in national insurance contributions erode disposable income yet further. The committee believes the two governments must engage on the impact of UK tax policies, including national insurance that interact with devolved tax policy, to ensure Scottish taxpayers are not negatively impacted. The Fiscal Framework Review provides an opportunity to put in place formal arrangements for intergovernmental working to ensure interactions between tax policy decisions by the UK and Scottish Governments are fully considered. Regarding tax receipts, the Committee was drawn to the reasons behind the gloomy forecasts. Labour market participation is driven by demographic factors and is declining as Scotland's population ages. The number of working age people aged 16 to 64 is falling, whilst fewer migrants and a record low birth rate mean an upward trend in the population aged over 65, many of whom have longer term health related needs. Any future population growth is projected to come from inward migration. The Committee would be keen to hear more about the work of the Population Task Force and how it plans to reverse adverse demographic trends, given there is no control over immigration. This presents challenges for Scottish Ministers in considering how to grow the working population and, in turn, income tax receipts. In scrutinising Scottish Government plans for the budget and resources available to it, the Committee wrestled with the figures and information received. Identifying and tracking COVID funding is becoming more difficult as the lines between what is and isn't COVID-specific funds are becoming increasingly blurred. While the Committee recognises the challenges around this, transparency in the full and timely presentation of figures is essential alongside how monies are allocated by the UK Government and subsequently Scottish Ministers and the impact of this expenditure. 
The committee flags this in its budget report. Transparency in the presentation of figures is also highlighted by Audit Scotland, who agree that the Scottish Government has had to act quickly and decisively to respond to the pandemic. Nevertheless, we would welcome clarification on how the additional financial package for business is being funded. As part of the fiscal framework review, both the UK and Scottish governments must consider and agree a process whereby Barnet consequentials are clearly communicated to bring greater certainty over what is new and what is reprofiled money. I briefly reference the fiscal framework review. While both the medium term financial strategy and resource spending review framework have informed our budget scrutiny, the committee is undertaking a separate, short, focused inquiry aimed at influencing the framework and a targeted content review of the strategy to ensure both support, both support parliamentary scrutiny. We will report on these in March. These reviews provide an opportunity to engage with stakeholders about how public resources should be invested to meet future challenges. The scope of the independent report to precede the fiscal framework review will focus on block grant adjustments only. The review itself will be broader and stakeholder views sought as part of both processes. It would be helpful to continue receiving updates from the Cabinet Secretary on the review and timetable. The Committee notes Scottish Government assumptions it will receive an extra income of £620 million for the resource budget in 2022-23 from a range of sources, including Crown Estate offshore wind leasing. The SFC expressed reservations about some of these sources, but thought on balance the assumptions were reasonable. When we agreed our report, there was a paucity of information about Crown Estate income that may contribute to the £620 million. The subsequent ministerial statement was useful in clarifying that money raised will reach the Scottish Exchequer, funding in part net zero policies with any surplus utilised across other portfolios. It would be helpful to know in more detail how and when the funding will be deployed and how Scottish ministers will secure economic benefits for Scotland. When the committee considered SFC concerns about future workforce and tax receipts, we specifically noted the loss of highly paid oil and gas jobs in North East Scotland, given the historic importance of this sector to overall income tax receipts and its projected decline. Such a huge structural change will surely require a change in the baseline figure by which the block grant adjustment is assessed. Scottish ministers are committed to using some of the Scotland leasing income to ensure a just transition for oil and gas workers. The committee will return to demographics and the tax base and looks forward to receiving the Cabinet Secretary's response on these matters. In terms of net zero ambitions, we welcome ongoing work by the Joint Scottish Government and Scottish Parliamentary Review of the Budget to improve information on climate change. To progress this, the Joint Review commissioned external research through Climate Exchange. An update was provided to the Committee last November and we look forward to more. It would be helpful to hear how the Cabinet Secretary intends to ensure the Joint Review delivers improvements to subsequent budgets in line with the programme of work shared with the Committee. And the FPA committee also included in our budget report comments on the replacement of EU structural funds. Having pursued them relentlessly since October, the committee will take evidence from Michael Gove MP, Minister for Leveling Up, Housing and Communities in February, and question him about the criteria for replacing EU funding. It would be useful to hear about representations from Scottish ministers to UK counterparts regarding a lack of clarity around the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Presiding officer, the FPA, FPA committee and its predecessors flagged preventive spend as an important area for prioritisation and remains convinced such spend can help protect the health of the nation and environment. The Scottish Government has set out the areas it wants to prioritise, but we seek clarification as to how ministers deliver preventative measures, along with examples of how this approach has resulted in a shift in policy and expenditure across this budget. The committee will return to this in a review. In conclusion, the Finance and Public Administration Committee looks forward to feeding our views into the Resource Spending Review, an opportunity for the Government to prioritise where it wants to spend its available funds in subsequent years. In doing so, Scottish ministers must prepare for potential future pandemics or adverse events to minimise the adverse impact of such shocks should they transpire. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I rise for the Liberal Democrats uh, to speak in the budget debate this afternoon. And as with all other budgets, uh, the Liberal Democrats approach this with uh, good faith and an open mind. But I'm afraid that a considerable gulf still exists between our position and that of the government and the budget that we debate today. And I will come on to the details as to why. Presiding officer, when governments set budgets, they must look to the most vulnerable in our society first and foremost and build their offer around them as a matter of principle. It is not clear that this has happened in the budget before us today. While it is a matter of public record that the Scottish Liberal Democrats support the doubling of the child payment, in this budget, what the SNP government take, give with one hand, they take away with another. Scottish families, and particularly those below the poverty line, are being hit hard and hit hard from all angles with the cost of food and energy 
absolutely soaring with the uh, rise of national insurance, the cut to universal credit. Many people are feeling the squeeze like never before. It's not clear that this budget entirely recognises that reality. The UK's biggest supermarket, Tesco, has said its prices could be set to rise by around 5%. Energy costs are reaching an all-time high, whilst wages stagnate due to inflation, which this year will reach its highest level in nearly 30 years. And Citizens Advice Scotland has found that a third of Scots are worried about being able to pay for food and for other essentials. Presiding officer, this means that parents will be facing the anxiety of not being able to provide for their children. That is not a good reflection on government in this Scotland, in, in our country. We need to reflect that crushing reality in this budget that we pass. But instead, we see cuts, and they are cuts to local government, and they will see an unavoidable rise in council tax, which will compound that reality still further. And despite... I will. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. He makes some general points about where he would like to see extra expenditure. Can he tell us where he would make savings to give more to families? Oh, it's cool, I'm grateful to the intervention. I'm going to come on to that in my speech, if I can make some progress. Um, despite the additional money announced this afternoon, COSA have already indicated, as Daniel Johnson says, that we're still facing a real terms cut to the local authority grant of around £250 million, much of which will be taken up with the £70 million uplift required to match the increase in national insurance contribution of employers. In Edinburgh, what that equates to, well, we've already seen SNP budget cuts impacting on every single primary and secondary school, removing all funding also from community police and all qualified teaching posts from our nurseries. In the Highlands, that's going to put pressure on services and local communities. Presiding officer, there was already a severe funding gap in the far north. This will only serve to compound that. And Cosler recognised this for what it is. They've told us, whichever way you look at it, the reality of the situation is yet again the essential services councils to deliver have been overlooked by this Scottish Government. Yet again. Now, I want to pause on those words because, presiding officer, this is a dance we do every single year. Every December, the Cabinet Secretary brings forward a budget that utterly terrifies our 32 local authorities, one that looks like it will demand cuts in every aspect of public spending. They are then held in that awful limbo until come stage three, or as it is today, the government miraculously find money down the back of the sofa. And then they are suddenly lauded as heroes for delivering a smaller budget cut than was expected, but it is a cut nonetheless. And would you believe it? Here we are again today. Presiding officer, I find the government's whole approach to local government finance quite shameful. And if Westminster was treating the Scottish government in the Thatcherite way it treats local authorities, then these benches would be taking to the streets. Cabinet Secretary. I think the member will find that him and his coalition partners in Westminster significantly reduced equivalent local authority budgets for years south of the border. But my question is actually whether he might speak to Willie Rennie, who made an excellent point, I thought, last week on local government funding in response to the Conservatives by saying, if all parties agree that we should pass on health consequences, where do we get the money from? Oh, it's Cole Hamilton. You can tell, uh, presiding officer, that the government is so deep in a hole that they have to dig back 10 years to tag my party. Presiding officer, the budget doesn't answer the crisis in social care either. Our care workforce is hollowed out, as we heard extensively today at FMQs. Our care staff are exhausted and they are telling us that they just cannot give the charges that they help the dignified support that they deserve. They are in desperate need of colleagues, but they won't find colleagues. They won't recruit new staff if that derisory settlement is all that is offered. This pay settlement is not transformational. It will not attract people into the profession and it is particularly myopic. Presiding officer, I said at the top of my remarks that we will always try to find consensus on the budget processes and in other things like the public health response. We act in good faith. But, presiding officer, this government do not make it easy. Once again, they have announced in recent days an overarching agenda which makes it almost impossible for the, well, entirely impossible for the Liberal Democrats to support it. Since the start of the emergency, the SNP have used the pandemic as a ubiquitous shield. It has deferred action and excused inadequacy by making repeated reference to the exceptional circumstances in which we find ourselves in the pandemic. Patients are waiting in pain. Children have been deprived life-qualifying 
education. Health workers are on their knees in want of a break. Those problems and those people have not gone away. In fact, they are growing every single day. But despite all of this, we are expected to believe that the pandemic and its impact have evaporated to the point where the government and this parliament will shortly drop everything to pass legislation on another independence referendum. And hidden in the pages of this budget, we know there is a cost to that preparation as well. An FOI published this afternoon reveals that nearly £700,000 a year will be spent in preparing the prospectus. It's not so much a white paper presiding officer as a white elephant. I will close by saying it is unforgivable. And for that reason, and the others I have offered, that we stand a considerable distance from the coalition government on this budget's priorities and will not vote for it tonight. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Douglas Lumsden. Thank you, presiding officer. As an MP, I sat in the Budget Bill Committee, the Base Select Committee, and my register of interest shows I remain an ambassador for the APPG for Fair Business Banking. In all these roles, I dealt directly with UK Treasury Ministers, so I have to say it's a pleasure to join this Parliament and deal with such a competent finance and economy team. <laughs> However, the greatest contrast is not at the personal level, but rather at the level of powers and constraints imposed on the budget setting process. We are currently facing major supply-side shocks caused by Brexit and the pandemic, as well as significant climate issues requiring sustained action towards our net zero ambitions. These three challenges have one element in common, the need for significant investment in Scotland's infrastructure and economic development. To that end, I commend the provision of significant support for the three economic development agencies, with spend being at its highest level since 2010 despite the wider financial challenges of setting this budget. But the constraints on the Scottish Government means we do not have sufficient powers to borrow to invest on the scale required. Not, uh, perhaps after this point, not just my view, but also that of Nigel Wilson, the Chief Executive of Legal in General. At the recent launch of their latest version of Rebuilding Britain Index, he called for a massive investment boom and increased borrowing powers for devolved administrations. The political narrative thus far from the Tories is to ask Scotland to give thanks for their largesse. But they fail to mention the ways in which the Scottish people for generations have been bankrolling the Scottish Government. UK government borrowing currently stands at over £2 trillion, according to the government's Debt Management Office. Most of this is funded through the issuance of gilts with purchases made by pension funds, investment trusts and some individuals. This is just one of the ways that Scots lend money to the UK government. But there's another route... Of course. Liz Smith. I, I, I'm very grateful to Michelle Thompson for giving way. Is she really saying that today's announcement that's come from the UK government isn't welcome? <laughs> of course Thompson. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that I do not have a paucity of ambition that means I go cap in hand asking for money. We are a wealthy country, we're a wealthy society, and I want to see a lot more ambition in this parliament for betterment. So, there's another route... No, I won't at the moment. There's another route where us Scots in return show our largesse. Some of the more mature members of the Parliament may hold premium bonds which provide cheap borrowing for the UK government given that only 1% per annum is distributed through winnings. Now, at the moment, the total value of UK premium bonds is currently £114 billion, representing around 5% of UK government debt. Through this relatively small financial vehicle alone, we can therefore estimate that Scots are currently lending the UK government almost £9.5 billion. Consider this another way then, through premium bonds alone, Scots have on loan to the UK government twice as much as the Scottish government is currently allowed to borrow in total for capital and revenue combined. These borrowing limits represent a quite ridiculous constraint on the Scottish Government and are dwarfed by the amount ordinary Scots lend to the UK Government. Another area... Quickly, yeah. Alex Cole-Hamilton. 
Thank you. I'm very grateful. I don't mean to interrupt Michelle Thompson in full cry, but we're fascinated by some of the numbers she's coming out with. Can she tell the Chamber when she expects to have her column regularly printed in the National with this kind of figures? <laughs> when Michelle they Thompson. ask me, I'd be delighted. Thank you for suggesting that. Another area is where the Scottish Government has denied the power to act is in financial crime. Stopping institutional crime is predominantly the preserve of the UK authorities, such as Companies House and HMRC, who do a poor job of preventing abuse of the financial system. Only this week, Lord Ag Agnew, the Treasury and Cabinet Office Minister, resigned over the UK Government's lamentable track record on COVID fraud, stating that Treasury showed no interest in tackling the issue. On the same day, Spotlight and Corruption published its report estimating that financial crime costs the UK economy £290 billion per year. The UK government has consistently failed to act on multiple calls over years to tackle large-scale financial corruption, as I know only too well from my work with the APPG I mentioned. Putting these figures there for another way, the UK government is failing to act on financial crime, costing approximately 276 times higher than the annual borrowing powers of the Scottish government. Presiding officer, excuse my uh, frustration at being boxed into a system where our people in Scotland lend to an incompetent Tory government that shields large-scale financial corruption, that denies our Scottish Government access to proper borrowing powers and subjects our budget to constant cuts. This is why I remain passionately ambitious for change in Scotland. We seek powers for a purpose. Scotland is our business and the SNP mean business. Only by having the normal financial powers of an independent country can we better fund the Scottish National Investment Bank, invest more in our infrastructure needs and increase our support for new developments such as hydrogen technologies. Thank you. Thank you. I call Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Public Finance Committee, we have been hearing evidence over a number of weeks from a variety of different groups. And what we have heard is a catalogue of confusion and obfuscation from the Scottish Government in terms of how they are spending resources. Uh, President Officer, this is a devolved government who love to make grand announcements but provide little detail on who are woeful on delivery. This is a government who care more about spin doctors than our nurses on the front line of our NHS. And I will give some examples on this. We keep hearing from this devolved government, we have heard it again today, our funding is going down. When in reality, it is going up, but of course they are muddying the waters, including the emergency COVID funding. No, I will make this point first, and then I will. The Fraser of Allender Institute has confirmed that the core resource block grant will be £35 billion in 2022-23, 8 per cent higher in real terms than it was in 2019-20, and higher than it has ever been out with the pandemic years. But it is all about grievance politics from this devolved government. I will take the intervention. So the Scottish Fiscal Commission sets our forecast. They are the ones that determine the budget. They claim that next year's budget is 5.2 per cent lower in real terms. Are they wrong? Douglas Lumsden. Well, what they are doing is including the, um, the emergency um, COVID funding. So what is the Fraser of Allender um, Institute wrong? You know, so they are right. So great. So we do know that the budget in core, the core budget has um, increased. And a great example of the political deceit is local government funding. The SNP Green Coalition of Chaos were badging it just earlier today as an increase. COSLA said it was a cut. The SNP Council leader said it was a cut. Spice tell it's a cut. And everyone in this chamber knows it's a cut of now £251 uh, million. And that's how the, uh, the devolved government views local government. And, you know, it's not really partnership in um, working. And um, it's, I agree with Alex Cole Hamilton. You know, we go through this pantomime every year as a, as a council leader for the last four years. Today is a bit like Groundhog Day. It was always about 350 million um, of, a, of a gap, and it was always 100 million thrown in at the last minute. We used to think it was a green saving a day, but now we know that it was going to happen anyway. I will take the intervention. I'm, I'm very grateful to the member for giving an intervention, uh, giving way. It's just a, a very, very simple question. Can he state the exact amount that he believes the total local government settlement should be in the budget? Douglas Lumsden. Yeah. <laughs> I'll easily set the budget for him if they want to move out of office. It's, once again, it's all spin. When you cut through the spin, 
when you cut through the spin, the detail is very hard to find from this government. For example, the North East Transition Fund remains a mystery which Agatha Christie could not solve. With little contact having been made with local authorities in the area and local representatives kept in the dark about the scope and the aims of the fund. We see it as a budget line, but where will the money will be spent? We don't know. How it will be spent? We don't know. And by whom? We don't know. And you know, what engagement will be made with local authorities in the North East and when? But of course, the budget is about priorities. And this is about a devolved government whose priorities are all wrong. The government priorities should be to help businesses recover from the pandemic, help our high streets and retail sector, find ways to help the economic divergence from the rest of the UK, grow our economy, manage the energy transition, and not throw the oil and gas industry under a bus. Instead, we see spending on offices and staffing abroad, but no detail or reasoning as to why this money is being spent or by whom it benefits. And of course, we see resource being diverted to planning for another divisive independence referendum, which of course will drive investment away, wreck business confidence, and be bad for jobs due to the uncertainty caused. We have seen from the Finance Committee's report the economic challenges that Scotland faces, and I have to say it's sheer reckless to be even talking about an independence referendum. If this government cared about Scotland's economic future, then they would take the threat off the table and now. Presiding officer, I remind members of my register of interest that shows that I'm still a member of Arvind City Council, and it's from a council point of view that makes me so angry about this budget. As well as cutting funding for essential services, this devolved Scottish Government has also increased ring fencing to council budgets, with further projects announcements mean that the bread and butter of council work, the issues that people care about, are cut further. Local councils deliver these projects in good faith, but are concerned with the funding being cut. Essential services can no longer be delivered. Yesterday, I took part in Aberdeen City Council's Education Committee, where we learned that the funding for early learning and childcare had been cut by 4.6 million, despite a promise from the Scottish Government to fully fund early learning. It's now a statutory service, so it must be delivered, meaning cuts to other services. Mori and SNP-run council also reported a 3.3 million black hole in their funding for ELC, thanks to the Scottish Government breaking their promise. Presiding officer, the reason I get so angry when it comes to local government funding is because I'm sick of the hypocrisy coming from this devolved government. Time and time again, we hear about prevention. I heard it at committee and I heard it in this place just yesterday. Early intervention is key to so many challenges that we're facing as a country, but much of the best prevention and early intervention takes place by local government. It is local government that provide the youth clubs, social centres, sports facilities, lunch clubs, community policing centres, community school counselling services. All of these services are now at risk if the Scottish Government fails to properly fund local councils. And these are the things that will bring savings to the health and justice budgets. These are the things that will improve people's outcomes. Without these preventative services, how will we tackle the challenges that Scotland face at the earliest possible opportunity? Presiding officer, this budget is a missed opportunity. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, presiding officer. This budget could not have come at a time of more economic and social uncertainty for families, for communities, and indeed for services across Scotland. The pandemic created unprecedented challenges for businesses, for our schools, and added immense pressure to our struggling health and social care sector. There has been more job uncertainty than ever before, and there isn't a high street in Scotland that hasn't seen closures over the last two years. So you would think, in the face of all of this, that the Scottish Government would have put forward an ambitious, forward-thinking, recovery-focused budget, but sadly, we are faced with something that largely disappoints. I do want to welcome the increase in the Scottish Child Payment, something that Labour and the third sector organisations called for and campaigned for, but make the observation that this will be insufficient to meet the target to reduce child poverty. It is the case that we are facing a cost of living crisis on a scale and intensity not experienced for many years. Household bills are rising, energy bills are rising, water bills are rising, and it is likely that the council tax will rise too. And faced with this year's budget document, it reads like missed opportunity after missed opportunity. 
the SNP are making hard-working families across Scotland pick up the bill for almost 15 years of fiscal mismanagement. Presiding officer, let me turn to the impact that this budget will have on our NHS and the social care sector. The First Minister earlier on today reminded us that she was the Health Minister previously. How could we forget? Because indeed, she was the Health Minister who failed to pass on record levels of funding for the NHS from a UK Labour government led by Gordon Brown. Had she passed on those Barnet consequentials she received to health from 2007 to 2010, instead of diverting the money elsewhere, the health budget would be a billion pounds more now than it actually is. Of course, the SNP used to say that all Barnet consequentials for health would remain in health, but that's simply not true now. Now they have a strange formulation of words that says it's the consequentials for frontline health and social care. And if you need any more evidence, just look at the £45 million taken from the health and social care budget given to the Business Hardship Fund in December. Now, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will have a line to take in a briefing to justify this. But how many care packages would £45 million have bought? How many delayed discharges could have been prevented to free up capacity in our hospitals? What measures could have been put in place to support staff? Figures published only yesterday by RCN Scotland highlighted the fact that a staggering six in ten nursing staff in Scotland are thinking about leaving the profession. Nurses told the RCN that they feel undervalued and poorly paid. This at a time when the NHS cannot afford to lose a single member of staff. But the workforce crisis existed before the pandemic. The First Minister cannot stand in the chamber and tell us how many more nurses there are when there are clearly not enough to meet demand. It is also just a little bit rich that when she was the health minister responsible for cutting the number of nurse training places. The facts are clear. There is a workforce crisis in our NHS. There is an urgent need to put measures in place to value and retain the existing workforce and to make sure there is a supply of clinical staff in the future. Yet the, well, no, I won't. yet the workforce planning strategy is delayed yet again. Delayed yet again. And what about the Health and Social Care Staffing Scotland Act, passed by this Parliament in 2019? It is all about safe staffing levels, high quality services, better outcomes for service users. Nothing with which anybody in this chamber would disagree. The government may point to the pandemic, but there is no reason not to implement this legislation now because so far they haven't brought it forward. It's not been implemented and it needs to be part of the context for workforce planning. Let me turn to social care. The 48 pence pay rise for social care workers is a slap in the face from the SNP and a stab in the back from the Greens who only months ago promised a £15 per hour wage in their manifesto. Absolutely. I, I know the member wants us to go further on social care pay but dismissing it as 48p reduces, I think, the impact of this. This is equivalent to £3,000 per annum if you compare last year's minimum wage with next year's £10.50. £3,000 and 10.5% increase. Uh, Jackie Bailey. But, but what the Cabinet Secretary fails to identify is this is a really severely low-paid workforce and she wants us to thank them for giving them a small increase. That simply isn't good enough. £12 an hour immediately. We've done the costing. She knows them. I shared them with her last year. We've shared them with her again this year. It's doable if you have the political will to do it. And the SNP, coupled with the Greens, simply do not. Presiding officer, delayed discharge remains a problem, as well as dealing with the issues of pay for social care workers. Delayed discharge removes bed capacity from the NHS. The numbers of people waiting for diagnostic tests and treatment is now a staggering 650,000 people. That's one in nine Scots. But to go back to social care, look at the Audit Scotland report. It found that social care workers, a predominantly low paid female, female workforce, felt that they were neither valued or rewarded for the work that they do. That's not me saying it. That's Audit Scotland telling this government that you're not paying social care workers enough. And the problems in social care are simply not addressed by this budget. Family carers have struggled to cope, 
as care packages are withdrawn, respite care is cancelled and support is removed. So urgent action is required to reinstate care across the country and this budget simply does not do it. Scottish Labour has set out detailed plans in our response to the budget of action that can be taken across the NHS and social care to address just these challenges. Plans that have been informed by talking to those on the front line of health and social care. Plans that are about supporting and restoring our NHS, improving social care, valuing the staff who are the backbone of both services. But I'm sorry to say, in conclusion, presiding officer, that this government are simply not listening. Happy to clap for NHS and social care staff on a Thursday, but when it comes to this budget, this, uh, this Thursday, they are simply deaf to their concerns. I now call John Mason to be followed by Miles Briggs. Hey, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I guess budgets are about choices and particularly how we choose to prioritise amongst a range of good things. Of course, we would all like to spend more on the NHS, as Jackie Bailey has just been saying. We'd like to spend more on local government. We'd like to spend more on business support, more on the railways, more on public transport, and so the list goes on. There are also the choices between spending more on existing services, including pay increases for public sector staff, or trying to expand services with initiatives like the child payment, 1140 hours nursery and child care, free bus travel for under 22s, and a national care service. Now, I guess there is no absolute right and wrong in these choices. We all have manifesto commitments, and I think we want to protect existing services as well as developing new areas at the same time. But we do all have to accept it is about choices, and particularly choices about how we spend the money we have. There does not seem to be much appetite for raising taxes, so we know roughly how much money we have. And the vast bulk of that money is being allocated in this budget, and so we know where it is committed to. So if there is an area we would like to see more spending on, and I suspect all 129 of us would like more money for something, then we need to be responsible and say where else should be a lower priority. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Mason for taking the intervention. He, he, of course, makes the same speech every year in the budget debate, so it wasn't a surprise to hear him make the points that he's making. But in terms of the premise of his, his, his uh, proposition he's putting forward, does he not accept what the Fiscal Commission have said, that the budget is £190 million less than it could be, and if the economic growth and tax revenues in Scotland matched the UK average, that would be nearly an extra £200 million back in this budget. John Mason. I, I think Murdo Fraser highlights a problem with the fiscal framework, and uh, I think uh, he, he may have not have heard, but the, we had evidence from Wales, for example, that they're getting an extra 5% uh, every time on the Barnet consequentials, which we miss out on. So I think uh, there are issues about how the whole thing is structured. We cannot compete with London, uh, and yet the system is set up for us to compete uh, with London. Now, the obvious choice that uh, we have to make, the biggest obvious choice, is between health and local government spending, as these are, these are the two largest parts of the Scottish budget, uh, something like 43% and 30% respectively, meaning that 73% of our budget goes in these areas. More money for local government broadly means less money for the NHS. More money for mental health means less for physical health. And I don't apologise for repeating these things every year because I don't believe the Conservatives and Labour have been listening. The Finance Committee spent a lot of time between 2011 and 16 looking at the question of preventative spending, especially following on from recommendations of the Christie Commission, and we have been returning to that again lately. But again, it's a question of choices. It's all very well stating that if we spend a pound on whatever today, we will save five pounds on something else in five years' time. That may well be true, and many third sector organisations are keen to tell us that. But that does not answer the question of where the one pound extra today is going to come from. That is broadly what is called disinvestment, meaning we reduce spending on something urgent and reactive today in order to spend preventatively and hopefully save money tomorrow. One example that previous members of the Finance Committee may remember was a, the American state, which needed a new prison, but they decided rather to put the money into preventative work. So in the longer term, they would not need so many prison places. But of course, in the short term, that meant they did not have enough prison places and there would be overcrowding and other problems. 
Therefore, in the same way, we face the potential decision of cutting back some important reactive expenditure in order to spend more on prevention. An example might be cutting back expenditure in hospitals and putting more into GP practices and primary health care. But when I asked John Swinney, who had been a previous Finance Cab Cabinet Secretary recently at committee, whether any party or individual MSP had ever asked him to cut current expenditure in order to spend on preventative measures, his answer was no, which shows how difficult it is to make these choices. To move on to some other aspects of the budget, firstly the £620 million, it, I think I probably don't have time, I'm sorry. Uh, firstly, the £620 million, uh, which is assumed for the resource budget, uh, but is not certain, and the conveners already touched on that. I think the committee and our advisers and witnesses consider it reasonable to include such a figure, although the exact amount and the timing of receipts is up for debate. In particular, the personal allowance spillover dispute has been running for quite some time, and I at least am certainly not clear when it is likely to be resolved and payment made. There is definitely a risk in the £620 million figure, although based on past experience, it is likely that Westminster will announce increased spending at some point, and we would then be due a share of this. However, I would also make the point that here that Westminster could be more helpful in clarifying earlier on what, if any, extra resources Scotland is getting, and I think the convener also touched on that. Uh, to some extent, I accept their argument that they cannot always guarantee Barnet consequentials, as happened at some points during COVID. However, I do think when they announce new spending in England, they should say up front how much of this money is really new and how much is therefore to be allocated to the devolved nations. Can I just say, too, in relation to capital expenditure and capital borrowing, it does concern me that we are heading towards our limit of £3 billion, and that is largely an artificial limit imposed by Westminster and does not take account of inflation or our ability to pay back. So to cut out a little bit of what I was going to say, I think we should be thinking about prudential framework, which works very well for local government. So overall, I'm very happy to support the budget at stage one. Both Labour and Conservative amendments, as usual, propose more spending without saying where the money would come from, and I would suggest they are both rejected. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Miles Briggs to be followed by Fiona Hislop. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start, as I did last week, um, when I opened our local government finance debate for the Conservatives, to thank all those who work in our local authorities across Scotland, especially uh, during the pandemic, for the work that they have done. And I want to, co to concentrate today my comments specifically on local government funding, because at 3pm today, COSLER and all local authorities across Scotland faced a cut of £371 million. As of now, and what the Cabinet Secretary has said, they will still face a cut of £251 million. The core local government budget, which has been frozen in real terms and represented a cut of £271 million, I believe now will represent a cut of £151 million. So across Scotland, council leaders, councillors will be considering what they actually need to cut in terms of services. Now, even after uh, what has been said today, SNP ministers and Green ministers indeed as well are asking our councillors and our councils to do more with less. Now, the Cabinet Secretary has tried, and the spin which we have seen coming out from government today and previously, to present this as a fair budget, but it is simply not fair to local government, and something has to change beyond what has been announced today. Now, I... Yes. Ross Greer. Thank you. I'm grateful to the member for taking intervention. On the theme of doing more with less, his colleague Lewis Smith proposed a further, cut to, a further increase in rates relief for the coming financial year. I was wondering how the Conservatives propose both funding that and finding the £250 million they presumably want for local authorities. From which other part of the budget would they take that money? I don't, breaks. I don't think Mr Greer is on particularly strong ground on this because last week I asked him specifically around national insurance and why the government haven't handed that on. And his response, I've actually got to hear, was there's no specific consequential for national insurance increases. Well, the Cabinet Secretary has announced £70 million worth of that funding today. Um, so I welcome that. But that is the UK government handing on £70 million, which he said didn't exist. The Cabinet Secretary has confirmed does. Um, if I can get the time back... Oh, no, I not happening. Okay. I, 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 I mean, it's just, it's just a secretary. Thank you. For, it's just a fundamental point of principle that in the UK government's budget to us, if the member can identify the line which states national insurance contribution in the budget we receive, I'd be really interested in seeing it. Well, there's over £800 million being passed on to all devolved governments. Our £70 million equates to £40 million uh, for local government. 
um, £30 million, of which is actually still to be presented for the teaching uh, pay rise, which we haven't necessarily heard anything from the government on today for how local authorities will meet that. That's maybe something for stage two when we'll get more detail. But I wanted to look at what we as a local government committee have also been looking at around this budget. And consideration um, has been given to a number of cuts which local authorities are facing. And we specifically heard from Martin Booth, who's Executive Director of Finance at Glasgow City Council, who was representing the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives and Senior Managers. And he specifically stated um, that during all their negotiations, or during all the work which is to come within councils, they're going to have to look at over £34 million of cuts, which was a leaked document we saw yesterday. Now, Mr Booth, given his evidence, stated the opportunity to increase charges is fair, fairly limited. Quite often, we are the provider of last resort. So the people who would be impacted the most by charging would be those we would like to impact on the least. So when SNP and Green Ministers try to spin this budget as one of delivering fairness for our communities, let's remember that every council across Scotland are going to be forced to make cuts because of this budget today. And it is little wonder that council leaders like SNP Dundee City Council leader John Alexander has labelled this budget perhaps the toughest in recent memory. I don't think what's been announced today is going to make that a statement go away or change. It is slightly less tough, but it is still going to be tough for local government, and that's something we all fear for services and the impact this will have. Now, COSLA have been clear um, that this SNP Green government need to look again at what they are providing to budgets, budgets to councils, um, simply, as they say, what we need to survive. And I don't know whether or not the Cabinet Secretary has really heard that message. I know the First Minister met with COSLA and council leaders this week. But simply for the UK government to be asked for, for £50 million of additional funding to be made available, which I welcome, and the national insurance contribution of £70 million, I don't think is enough. And I think we need to see at stage two and three a serious look at that again. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary genuinely um, has heard that message, even from leaders of Highland Council, who have also condemned this budget as well. So conclu to conclude, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, let us be in no doubt today, if SNP Green Ministers do not look again at local government funding in this budget, it will hit the most vulnerable in our society. The Finance Secretary clearly knows, and we know this from every debate we now have in this Parliament, that Greens' votes are in the bag on this, that deals done behind closed doors will see this government be able to get this budget through Parliament. But I would appeal to Green MSPs and every MSP who will be out campaigning for their SNP councillor colleagues. They need to speak out as we see this budget go through. These are SNP green cuts which will have impact on all services. And in May at the council elections, I hope they pay a severe price for that. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Fiona Hislop to be followed by Ross Greer. Presiding officer, I want to address the context in which this budget is set and the implications of that. Positively, uh, Scottish economic growth returned to pre-pandemic levels in November. Scotland is developing and delivering and building on strong economic strengths in key sectors for a modern economy. Negatively, the drag of Brexit continues to hinder economic growth, uh, with the OBR forecast that Brexit will reduce the UK's potential productivity at twice the level of that of the COVID pandemic impact. And Brexit has sorely hindered the availability for skilled labour, the number one concern of many businesses. And after years building up exports, we see eye-watering drops in export business. But the financial arrangements of this Parliament, which just about everyone now acknowledges, cannot respond properly to crises like that of COVID. This Parliament has no substantial powers to borrow. Uh, more generally, the adjustments from the UK are unpredictable and lack transparency, and transfers are often way behind the original announcement of health or business or culture or other funds for England, where Scotland is due its fair share. And often, as we've heard for this, uh, from, from today's announcement, uh, very late in the financial year. It raises expectations of people in need in Scotland that cannot be fulfilled until finally those transfers are made. So, presiding officer, there is a vice-like squeeze on the parameters of what the financial secretary can work with in her decisions on the budget. The fiscal framework review must look at these issues. Multi-year funding would be welcome improvement within uh, and to the Scottish budget. 
And on top of this, we have political choices being made in Scotland, which are diverging, in part due to specific Scottish choices to deliver fair, progressive and net zero policies, but in part by the UK Government's decisions for England, where political choices to transfer funding for services in the wider health or education services to private models reduce the commensurate payments to Scotland. That is the nature of devolution, when you have governments from different parties with different priorities, and it has consequences. But even if you believe it ever did work once, the financial arrangements for this Parliament cannot be said to work properly for Scotland now. The wealth, capability and economic and financial power of Scotland needs to be leveraged for all Scotland. And that, as we heard from Michelle Thompson, far outweighs the confines of the Scottish Government's budget. It's the tools to magnify the budget that we need. Health and Social Care, Presiding Officer, now... Yes, indeed. Liz Smith. I, I to disagree with some of the comments that Fiona Hislop has made, particularly echoing some of the uh, issues that were raised at the Finance Committee. But would you accept that John Swinney signed the uh, fiscal framework along with the UK Government in 2016? It's not just a question uh, of Scotland being able to decide. It's a question of both governments and both the SNP and the UK Government agreed on that. I, I, acknowledge, I acknowledge the history of the agreement of the, the fiscal framework, but she should also acknowledge that everybody understands it needs to be improved and changed. And that's why, in terms of the review that I hope will address some of these issues, some of the criticisms that people have made in, in this chamber already could be addressed by that review. Looking at the budget as it stands now, health and social care um, uh, now account for £18 billion and with 12.5 12, 12 billion for local council, that means 30.2 billion pounds, or in that count, 68% of Scotland's budget um, is distributed to health, social care, and local government alone. Now, it's a percentage which is steadily increasing, and with a needed national care service on the horizon, will increase further. Now, that means that other important—I want to move on. That means that other important portfolios are left with the remaining 32% and have to take the strain and absorb the pressures. So, even within these constraints, I was pleased to see the cabinet secretary support funding for the three enterprise bodies at the highest level since 2010, and deliver deliver its commitment to the Scottish National Investment Bank. I am concerned, however, that Phase 2 recovery for tourism, as recommended from the Scottish Tourism Recovery Group, as yet has no funding. As much of what is needed is for one-off promotional work, I would urge that this area be a priority for any early in-year underspends and that it does not wait until near-end reconciliations and adjustments. So, despite a real terms cut in the capital budget of 9.7%, the Scottish Fiscal Commission states that it should be able to meet the national, uh, the government should be able to meet the national infra infrastructure mission target. But they are concerned about net zero needs, which is capital dependent in many cases. On net zero, making funding work, leveraging private funds, we face a very uh, real uh, danger and a serious risk aversion by councils and other public bodies co-funding private sector initiatives to cut net zero if the centralising subsidy control bill at Westminster passes without serious amendment. So the Cabinet Secretary has an enormous challenge and an increasingly difficult challenge. Meanwhile, at Westminster, we see UK Minister Lord Agnew resign because of his concern that £4 billion, and I repeat, £4 billion pounds of funds is being lost because of a systemic failure to operate fraud recovery and initial prevention from the COVID loans. And I quote, ably assisted by the Treasury, who appear to have no knowledge or interest in the consequences of fraud to our economy and society. Scotland needs to be independent by right, but it must be independent for a purpose. The purpose of independence is so we can shape our own future with a budget supported by policies which reflect the values and the vision of the people of Scotland and not the waste and wantonness of Westminster. Scotland has got what it takes. What we need is a fresh start for Scotland with independence. Thank you. I now call on Ross Greer to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like Miles Briggs and others who, who spoke last week, some of what I'm about to say is very much a repeat of that debate, though uh, myself and Mr Briggs are certainly not singing from the same hymn sheet. Given some of the contributions made so far this afternoon, I think it is important, though, to re-emphasise the context of this budget as we discussed last Wednesday. Scotland's budget for the coming year will be around 5% lower than for 21-22. 
That is the result of COVID consequentials being largely withdrawn when COVID and its consequences, its physical consequences across the country, are still very much with us. As an example, bus and rail use are down by a third. That requires significant subsidy to keep essential services operating. But without last year's COVID consequentials repeating, the choice is to either provide those subsidies to operators from the core transport budget, putting pressure on the other areas it funds, or to let public transport services collapse across the country as operators withdraw. These pressures are being felt across every area of government spending at the moment, and no opposition party has yet put forward a proposal for bridging that billion-pound gap, whether it be through tax rises, spending cuts, or some combination of the two. It is easy to call for more spending in the areas that we all care about. I certainly want to see it. But whilst it is reasonable to some extent for external stakeholders to push for spending in their areas without saying where it would come from, there is a responsibility on members of this Parliament to do more than just make impossible demands. The Greens did better than that from opposition. We wanted to increase spending on everything from the core local government settlement to public sector pay and the Nature Restoration Fund, and we did secure that. But we did it alongside proposals that we made and then secured for tax changes, for an end to the council tax freeze, for an overhaul of the rates and bans of income tax. That option of constructive engagement was available to all opposition parties, but year after year, instead, we saw exactly what we're seeing this afternoon demands for more spending from a fixed budget without any explanation of where it would come from. That wasn't even an electorally rewarding strategy in the last session, so I really can't understand why it's being doubled down on now. I'm proud of what this budget, the first co-produced by Greens from inside government, includes. It reflects the strategic priorities of this government, tackling the climate emergency, eradicating child poverty and a green recovery from the economic damage of the pandemic. Yes. Miles um, I appreciate the member taking an intervention. Why is this SNP Green Government not see local government as a priority any longer? Ross Green. This government prioritises local government to the extent that the local government settlement is increasing by more than a billion pounds in the coming financial year compared to the current ones. That's a six terms real percent increase in their budget. And this budget fully funds the first year of free bus travel for young people. That's a flagship green policy, a genuinely transformational initiative, which will ease the pressure on family budgets as other costs of living are increasing, and it will help take cars off the road, cutting emissions and cleaning up the air in our urban areas. It provides a record £150 million for walking, wheeling and cycling, £35 million for low emission and ultra low emission buses, again contributing towards public health and climate ambitions. And it establishes the fund first proposed by the Greens and exactly as Unite the Union have asked for, which will assist local authorities to develop plans for bringing local bus services back into public ownership. With transport having been the one area in which emissions have risen rather than reduced in Scotland, these investments are absolutely critical if we are to play our part in giving this planet a fighting chance of staying below two degrees of warming. Transport is far from the only area in which climate action has been prioritised, though. The Climate Justice Fund has been trebled. £50 million has been allocated to support farmers to tackle both the climate and nature crises. The first £20 million of the North East and Murray Just Transition Fund is provided. There is £45 million to progress the circular economy and reduce waste, and £2 billion overall for climate initiatives. One measure in this budget that I am particularly proud of is the piloting of a four-day working week. This has become an increasing priority of both the Greens and the trade union movement, and I am glad that we will be able to progress it through pilots in this coming year. And turning back to local government, despite the pressure mentioned earlier, this budget delivers a real terms increase to the local government settlement. That includes an additional £145 million for teacher recruitment. That is enough to fund 2,500 permanent posts. There is £72 million for P1 to 5 free school meals, £30 million in capital funding to facilitate the expansion of those free meals to primary 6 and 7 as soon as possible. There is £175 million to fund the pay increase for care sector workers and £200 million for health and social care. That's not me suggesting everything is rosy. COSLA does have a perfectly legitimate case to make for more funding, and they're not the only ones. This budget represents the fairest possible distribution of extremely limited funding in extremely challenging circumstances. And once again, I'm yet to hear from exactly where the opposition would reallocate a further £250 million, or what changes they would make to tax policy to raise £250 million in new revenue. I am grateful for the contribution made, though, by Green councillors across the country, whose feedback we were able to take into discussions with the Cabinet Secretary. The additional £120 million confirmed today will certainly go a long way. The only income tax proposal that I can remember coming from the Conservatives, uh, by contrast, though, the only one that they brought, I think, in the entirety of the last session of this Parliament, 
was a cut to the tax rate for the highest earners in this country that would have taken a further half a billion pounds out of our budget. And we've heard yet again today another proposal, a perfectly legitimate proposal for further rate relief, but one that would only grow the gap in our public finances and no explanation of where that money would be found from. I'm certainly of the view that substantial additional revenue will need to be raised through changes to our existing tax mechanisms and the creation of new ones. For the reasons cited by the Convener of the Finance Committee, bold decisions will be required in this parliamentary session if we are to meet the ambitious targets we have set ourselves, particularly on child poverty reduction and net zero. The Greens are certainly prepared to make further constructive proposals where, for where the additional revenue we believe can come from. For now, though, we are proud to vote for a budget which certainly delivers for people and for planet. Thank you. I now call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Human rights belong to all of us. When determining whether or not we are pr promoting them and protecting them, the first thing we must do as a nation is consider what the minimum core of those rights should be. The idea of a minimum core is simple. It sets a red line below which people should not fall. In a wealthy nation like Scotland, the minimum core of these rights should be high and it should be met. It only takes a short glance around the reality of food bank use, child poverty, in-work poverty and care workers on poverty pay to realise that we are not meeting even the lowest of bars. It is often said that governments shouldn't tell us what they value, but show us where they're putting their money. The government have said that child poverty and reducing inequality is what they value. But I am deeply frustrated that this budget does not go far enough or fast enough to address either. The task ahead is huge. Child poverty in Scotland sits at 25%. That's one in four children. And I doubt anyone in this chamber is comfortable hearing that figure. But this budget will not set us on track to meet our child poverty targets. Scottish Labour have called for an increase in the Scottish child payment, but the Scottish Government's plans don't go far enough. The increase is too small for us to stop there and helps too few for us to call it anything like a victory. And it will not allow us to meet our targets. This is not just my opinion. Earlier this week, their own advisers in the Poverty and Inequality Commission confirmed what we already know, that the Scottish Government simply is not going hard or fast enough to meet the child poverty targets this Parliament set unanimously and without caveat. To miss those targets would be a complete dereliction of duty, and unless the Government takes urgent and bold action, that is exactly the path it is heading down. The only guaranteed way of ensuring we meet our interim target is to increase the Scottish Child Payment to £40 by April 2023. The Scottish Government has run out of other options. Even at the current rate, the Scottish Child Payment is failing to deliver for thousands of children. While they wait for full rollout, 125,000 eligible children are not receiving any payment at all. I have asked the Government at every turn whether it will address this, and I have suggested how, but there is still no commitment or no plan to do it. I cannot, they cannot ignore this. These children depend on their government to find a solution. There are 170,000 children who do get bridging payments, but they will miss out on the vital £10 increase to the Scottish Child Payment. The government have made no provision to double the bridging payments, and when I have asked about this, it has given no indication that they intend to change it. Deputy Presiding Officer, 295,000 children will not receive the £20 payment they are entitled to when the increase comes into effect later this year. Over one third of them will receive nothing at all. The budget does little to address inequality either. We cannot address women's or disabled people's inequality if we do not address the care economy. The pay offer for care workers is a paltry 40p increase. I look to my Scottish Green colleagues, who now sit in government, who committed to a £15 an hour pay rate for social care workers, as did all of us on the Labour benches, and ask why they believe it is, suffi it is sufficient now. Unpaid carers, I will. Ross Grieve. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention on that point. In opening for Labour, colleague Daniel Johnson acknowledged that difficult decisions will have to be made. I would love to see care workers earning £15 an hour. What difficult decisions would the Labour Party take to fund that if they were in government? Pam Duncan Glancy. I, I'm sure the member will, will have heard my colleague Jackie Bailey explain earlier on to the First Minister that we have fully costed this. And if he is committed to his manifesto and the manifesto that he stood on, then I'm sure he will be um, eager to read it and help get it delivered. Unpaid carers, most of whom are women, have stepped up and stepped in throughout the pandemic. 
plugging the gaps of, so of a social care system that does not meet people's needs, and now they are floored. This budget has let them down too. Despite reassurances given by the Minister for Social Security last year, no provision has been made in the budget to extend the double payment of Carers Alliance supplement. This government rushed through legislation on the matter, limited opportunities for scrutiny and batted back criticism about the limited nature of the double payment extension. It reassured the Parliament committees and carers that the legislation allowed scope for the government ministers to extend the payment going forward and rejected amendments from the Scottish Labour Group that, it would, that would have protected the uplift. I have lost count of the number of times I have spoken and heard in this chamber about the detrimental impact of removing the universal credit uplift. So I am looking at this budget and I ask this government, why does this budget not include the uplift you promised unpaid carers? And if you still intend to double their payment, where will you find the additional funding in June? It is not only underfunding in care that risks furthering inequality either. The budget line for lone parents, the majority of whom are women, is now set at zero. Unless we properly recognise the value women's work, design a system that supports their participation in the workplace and recognises unpaid work, then tackling the gender pay gap and, and moving towards our child poverty targets will be a distant dream. Deputy Presiding Officer, the third, third sector too has long been key to addressing inequality, and this year they too have gone above and beyond, so I am dismayed at the Government's decision to cut their budget. SCVO have been clear that these cuts threaten weakening support for voluntary organisations and their volunteers, and I urge the Government to reconsider. Lastly, Deputy Presiding Officer, I started my contribution talking about human rights. We immunise our country against a virus that has exacerbated inequality. We needed a budget today that immunised against inequality and protected human rights. But to do this, we also needed to be able to assess the impact of what we are doing. But I am concerned that the considerable data gaps that must be addressed if we want to do this do not exist and will not be rectified until 2025. Deputy President Officer, this budget will not meet child poverty targets, will leave women on low pay, will deny disabled people the support they need and fails to fund the third sector properly. Because of these things, and for so many in Scotland, it will not enable the realisation of the most basic of rights. It is far too little, and we already know it is far too late, especially for the hundreds of thousands of children in poverty. We are staring long-term inequality in the face. This budget does not deliver nearly the scale or pace we needed to address it. We are Scotland. Our ambitions are high, and we needed a budget that met them, empowered us to realise our human rights and escape poverty and inequality. As it stands, I and others do not believe that this budget will do it. And I ask the government to reconsider its budgetary priorities so that it ensures people can reach their full potential. And Scotland really can be the land of opportunity we all want and need it to be. Thank you. I now call Paul McLennan, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'm delighted to be speaking in this Stage 1 budget debate today, which has at its heart it's about building a fairer, greener and more prosperous Scotland. As we recover from COVID, securing stability and support for my constituents in East Lothian, Scotland is my utmost priority, and this budget sets out an ambitious path while balancing the management of the COVID crisis and, of course, the rising cost of living. Our public services and the hardworking people within them have held the country together during the pandemic, and I want to thank all those who have worked in our public services. To those in East Lothian and Scotland, we owe you a, a, great, a debt of gratitude. As we continue the battle against COVID, this budget has set out provisions to bolster support for our public services, such as the record £18 billion investment in health and social care. This investment includes £1.6 billion for social care and integration. And of course, this will progress the commitment to increase spend by 25 per cent by the end of this Parliament. It also sees an increase to nearly £13 billion for our health boards. This general package will be an essential in support of vital services in East Lothian and beyond. As we rebuild our economy, we are taking every step to ensure the approach prioritises the needs of the people of Scotland. Now, as a strong advocate for the wellbeing economy, we must see economic recovery as putting the health of the people and our environment first. A principled, focused approach on wellbeing is going to help Scotland heal from COVID and meet the challenges of the cost of living crisis impacting on our constituents. In November, the Wellbeing Alliance Scotland produced a report called Failure Demand, which argues we should be doing more in preventative spend. And what the point they're trying to make an argument result the failure to do so will see government spending more money in the long term. The £20 universal uh, credit cut is a prime example. How much is that going to cost us and other services in Scotland in the months and years ahead? And of course, alongside in fixing these harms, we in Scotland are spending £600 million in mitigating harmful policies from Westminster, such as the bedroom tax. £600 million. 
The most recent UK budget has also seen measures which exacerbate the cost of living in crisis, with national insurance rising, whilst energy prices soar alongside the highest inflation rate for many a time. I want to focus on a few other commitments. An investment of £831 million into affordable housing, delivering 110,000 affordable energy efficient homes across the next decade, will of course benefit all of our constituents, every single one of us in here. The Scottish Government is putting welfare first, with an investment of over £4 billion in social security and welfare payments, including doubling the game-changing Scottish Child Payment. Of course we need to do more, but this is a massive step forward. Tackling inequalities is core to building a more fair and equal society. The Scottish Government's commitment to a £500 million whole family wellbeing fund and investing 5% of community-based health and social care spending on preventive whole family support is very welcome. We had a debate just on that in just, I think, a few weeks ago. This has been recognised by all parties in the Chamber as a key element in tackling poverty, supporting attainment and preventing mental health issues. This investment will help the Scottish Government deliver commitments made when accepted the, prom- the report of the Independent Care Review. The promise. East Lothian has been a key player in showing the path for sustainable living, with towns such as Dunbar as Scotland's first zero-waste town. I am proud that this budget works to tackle climate change with a commitment to a just transition, which provides £2.5 billion of public and private investment needed to meet our zero net, net zero target. This investment, alongside equipping businesses to grasp opportunities in recovery, will secure new, new jobs and lay out the routes for long-term security and prosperity. I already see the opportunities and he's still in that regard. £350 million to drive forward decarbonisation and a generous package to support active travel. Travel has also been key commitments within the pledge to tackle climate change. The budget is a, a step in the right direction. The wellbeing economy is something that we can achieve. We hear many, uh, uh, this being discussed in many a debate, but it is something we can achieve. With ambitious policies, our, our economy can prosper and Scotland can care for the environment and its people. President officer, I want to touch on the constraints that we've had a, as a, uh, we have as a devolved nation. The Fraser Valander and their report and devolved fiscal framework said in borrowing powers, there is a case for a modest extension to the scope and scale of the devolved government's borrowing powers in normal times. The ability to, uh, to borrow to fund discretionary resource spending would provide additional flexibility to respond to unforeseen events and therefore reduce the need to hold back funding instead. We've already heard about, issue, heard about issues around about that. Even fairly substantial, I'm quoting here, even fairly substantial borrowing by the devolved governments would have little impact, little impact on the UK's borrowing and debt. This level of flexibility would allow us to invest more in our recovery, such as funding more in the Scottish National Investment Bank. The IFS added, with the new Omicron variant of coronavirus across the UK, it is vital to learn lessons from earlier waves of the pandemic to the devolved government's funding arrangements. And again, a quote, if new policy and spending announcements start to come in quick succession, the devolved government should swiftly be given some combination of the funding guarantees successfully deployed last year and or enhanced borrowing powers to allow them to respond in a timely and effective way. I look forward to both the Labour and Conservative Party supporting that, 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 that view. Presiding officer, in conclusion, without the full economic levers of independence, we cannot fully deliver the bold economic redesign that a well-being economy requires. I support this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now uh, move to the closing speeches, and I call firstly on Paul Sweeney to wind up for Scottish Labour around six minutes, please, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think today has been a frustrating experience for many in this chamber. As colleagues have outlined, this budget has uh, meant to be uh, a recovery budget. It was meant to be a bold statement of intent for the country. Instead, it is one that fails to address the lasting impact of COVID, fails our local authorities and public sector workers, and risks compounding the financial challenges faced by households across Scotland. As my friend, the member from the Barton, has uh, said, the 48p pay increase for social care workers is unacceptable given the tireless work they put in as part of the national effort to tackle the virus. The government should treat fair pay for workers as an urgent priority and commit to an immediate £12 an hour settlement, moving towards a £15 baseline as soon as possible, in line with our aspirations for the national minimum wage itself. If only all consequentials for health had been protected, that would have been a mechanism to deliver that measure that would have driven wealth back into the lowest paid sectors of the economy. And I thank my Glasgow colleague, Pam Duncan Glancy, for her strong case for further increasing the Scottish child payment. If we are to have a hope of coming close to the target of reducing child poverty to 10% in relative terms by 2030 from a current situation of 25% and flatlining, indeed potentially even getting worse in the coming year, The Fraser of Allender Institute's own modelling has said that Scotland could meet its child poverty targets. All three of the policy models published succeeded in meeting the targets, and all three of the policy models included a significant increase to the child 
uh, Scottish Child Benefit Payment. Indeed, it may well be game-changing, as CGAP have said, but I'm afraid the Scottish Government are playing that game very badly indeed. In the face of the cost of living crisis, a commitment from Government to further doubling the payment is therefore even more pertinent, and we wish to see that take place in this financial year. It makes sound economic sense to do this too. Think about the tax base underperforming the UK. Surely the lowest income households need every penny because every penny will be spent back out into the economy, creating a multiplier effect that will therefore repay itself in due course and increase the tax base in time. That is what we call a virtuous cycle rather than a vicious cycle. And if only there were more economists rather than accountants in government, perhaps we would have that sort of thinking at the heart of what is going on in this budget. I'd like to turn to the cuts faced by local authorities too. Since 2013, the Scottish Government's revenue fiscal resource budget limit has increased by 3.1%. Yet despite this, the funding they have allocated to councils has decreased by 2.4%. So the starting point today was a cut of £371 million to councils across Scotland. Now it has been ameliorated by an announcement of an additional £121 million pulled out of the bag. Um, I'm sure the councillors will be grateful across Scotland to that. I doubt it indeed, because it's cold comfort when it leaves £250 million, £250 million uh, more for councillors to cut. How are they going to do that? It faces an, it's an invidious choice faced by councillors, and it is a one-year patch-up job in an election year for councils. The government has put local authorities in an impossible situation, Deputy Presiding Officer, where they will have to consider cuts to local services, increasing the price of accessing local amenities when there is already a cost of living crisis, or hiking the regressive and obsolete council tax, which this government pledged to axe in 2007 to make up for that critical and fundamental lack of funding. Indeed, Glasgow City Council's draft budget options for the next financial year includes horrific proposals to offset £33.9 million in funding gap by axing a holiday scheme for children eligible for free food, withdrawing services for dyslexic pupils, increasing crematorium charges for bereaved families and cutting teaching staff. Now, that, that effect may well be reduced marginally by what was announced today, but it certainly isn't going to take the pain away completely. In fact, it only addresses a third of the cuts potentially faced by local government. The bulk of the pain remains, and it is disingenuous and cowardly of this government to force councillors to wield the knife in this way. On February the 17th, councillors in Glasgow will be asked to agree that budget, which is simply about how to slice a much smaller cake. The fact there will be severe cuts is a fait accompli decided by this government that controls 80% of Glasgow City Council's annual budget allocation. The Happy to get taken into Ross Green. Thank you. The member seems to be suggesting it should be this government rather than local authorities making difficult decisions, taking aside the difficult decisions that have already been made in this budget. If this was a Labour government, where, from what has already been allocated, would they find £250 million? Where would they cut or where would they raise taxes? Paul Sweeney. Well, I thank the, the member for his intervention. Of course, note the commitment of the Greens to protecting local government and increasing it in real terms every uh, a year of this parliament, which has obviously not been achieved. And as for how we address the tax gap and increase the revenues, we have presented creative ideas. In fact, there was cross-party commissions, including his former colleague Andy Whiteman, who suggested introducing land value tax that would have raised an additional £12 billion in revenues for Scotland. We could be introducing and pushing these ideas now. Where is the sense of urgency coming out of this pandemic? Where is the idea of fundamental renewal? Local government, the settlement that was achieved in 1996, has fundamentally failed. And we need a root and branch review of local government. It's something that devolution has failed to address in two decades. That is something I hope we can all agree needs to happen sooner rather than later. The impact in funding is evident to citizens across the country, no more so than in Glasgow. We have seen communities having to go and picket their libraries week in, week out to protect the most fundamental services. We have seen facilities lying empty, like the iconic People's Palace, if Labour had done that in administration, we would have been hounded weekly and relentlessly by the SNP, yet it passes without comment. Facilities in Deniston, like the Whitehill Pool, are on the brink of collapse due to repair backlogs. The city's cleansing department is falling apart. Our councils deserve better, Deputy Presiding Officer. Workers deserve better. And quite frankly, Scotland deserves better. It's for that fundamental reason that Labour cannot possibly support the budget at stage one, given the severity 
and the civic vandalism that this budget proposes. And like member, I would also urge members, therefore, to support our reasoned amendment to try and salvage this budget before it is too late. Thank you. I now call on Murdo Fraser to wind up for the Scottish Conservatives. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is my pleasure to uh, close this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. I will start uh, where the debate set off, talking about the size of the overall budget settlement. Because the backdrop to this bill is the most generous budget settlement from the UK in terms of a core block grant in the history yep. of devolution. And the Finance Secretary should be turning cartwheels down the cannon gate, celebrating the fact she has more money than any of her predecessors in office. If we, oh, of course. Do Come I or do I not have more money next year compared with this year? Martin Fraser. Presiding officer, taking out the extraordinary additional sums paid for COVID in the last financial year, this year's core block grant is up 10.6% in cash terms, 8% in real terms, some £3.9 billion extra, as Liz Smith said earlier. You think they'd be celebrating that additional resource, presiding officer, the largest block grant in the history of devolution? Now, speakers on the SNP benches like to talk about how this is a fixed budget. Now, of course, that's not correct, because this government has tax varying powers. It's free to use if it feels this budget is insufficient. It used to be the case this government called for the devolution of air passenger duty, yep. so, so it could cut that tax. It used to uh, call for the devolution of corporation tax, so it could cut that tax, and it has reneged on both these policies. Instead, it uses its tax powers to increase the tax burden on ordinary working Scots, and it damages our economy as a result. This week, we saw a damning report from the uh, Finance Committee, a cross-party uh, report on the Scottish budget, concluding that Scotland is lagging behind almost all other areas of the United Kingdom in key indicators of economic performance, and that is deeply worrying. We have the same macroeconomic policies across the whole United Kingdom, and yet Scotland almost uniquely is performing the poorest. So we have to conclude responsibility for that rests at the door of this SNP government. And the consequence of that is clear when it comes to the Scottish public finances, with our block grant being reduced due to poor Scottish income tax performance. According to the Fiscal Commission, as the committee convener reminded us earlier in the debate, the budget is expected to be £190 million worse off because of fiscal devolution, and that figure rises in subsequent years. So here we have a tale of two governments. A Conservative government in Westminster putting more money into the Scottish budget, more than ever before, and an SNP government here in Holyrood due to its economic incompetence, actually reducing the money available because we're not matching the economic performance elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Uh, yes, I'll certainly give Michelle Thompson. In contrast of the two governments, I'm really interested to hear if anyone on these Tory benches is prepared to condemn the fact of financial crime under the regulation of the Tory government of £290 billion every year that has a direct consequence on the money available to this Parliament and, in turn, money available to councils. Will you condemn their lack of action? What a splendid line of attack that would be if this government had such strong fiscal rectitude that not a penny was being wasted. And that sets me up so nicely for my next point, because we've been challenged throughout this debate. Mr Mason, in his annual speech to this uh, debate, uh, making his points, and Ross Greer made the same points about where the opposition would find additional money. Let's just summarise where we could find some savings. £200 million spent building two ferries that are probably never actually going to serve any island communities and are years behind schedule. £40 million paid in compensation so far for the victims of the malicious prosecution of those involved with Rangers Football Club. Tens of millions of pounds paid in subsidies to Brestway Airport, to Bifab, to Liberty Steel. Millions paid out in legal costs defending unsuccessfully challenges against this government, including from their former First Minister, the man who cannot be named, and now all the resources being spent preparing for another bill on an independence referendum everybody knows is not going to happen. That is where the money could come from and be far better spent on the people's priorities rather than wasted uh, as it currently uh, is. Now, despite all the extra money that we've identified that is available to this government, what do they actually deliver? They deliver a real terms cut in the funding of local authorities. 
estimated uh, by COSLA at £371 million. Pounds. That's money just to stand still, not to do anything extra, money just to stand still. Now, we heard uh, earlier in this debate uh, from the Finance Secretary an extra £120 million pounds from the UK Treasury. We should welcome the fact money from the UK Government is mitigating the impact of SNP cuts on our communities. So that's very uh, welcome. But that still leaves us with a cut of £251 million pounds just to stand still still, as Douglas Lumsden said. And that's going to mean, when it comes to May, increases in, in council tax and cuts to local services. And like Miles Briggs, I'm sure people will be reminded of that on the doorstep in the run-up to the elections in May. That's what this SNP government is delivering for us. Now, presiding officer, that's a settlement that's been attacked by council leaders across the political spectrum, including uh, from uh, SNP council leaders. Shame on the SNP government for delivering these cuts. And shame on the Greens for enabling them. Because yep. I remember in previous years, we could perhaps have relied on Andy Whiteman yep. and his negotiating skills as part of the Green Group to force the SNP government to provide more generous support uh, to local councils. Alas, a sad loss to this Parliament. Yep. Andy Whiteman is no longer here. His memory is being besperched by his erstwhile colleagues in the Green Party. And with him gone, they've sold their souls for ministerial salaries and ministerial limousines as our councillors and local communities, which are poorer as a result. Presiding <laughs> officer, Fiona Hislop and Paul McLennan talked, of course, about independence. If only we were independent, how much money we would have. Well, oh, presiding officer, there we go. There we go. I would suggest very gently to them they read the paper published this morning by David Phillips for the Institute for Fiscal Studies, saying that in his uh, calculations, Scotland's projected deficit in, in 2026-27 would be 7.5% of GDP, almost £3,000 for every man, woman and child in Scotland, and that would mean tax rises and spending cuts, and they have no idea how to meet any of these challenges, presiding officer. So, presiding officer, this is not a budget Scottish Conservatives can support. With record sums to spend, it actually delivers cuts to the services people rely upon, where money is being wasted and spent on SNP vanity schemes. I urge the Chamber to vote it down at decision time. Thank you. And I now call on Kate Forbes, Cabinet Secretary, to wind up the debate. Please take us to decision time. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, stage one of a budget which tackles poverty and helps families with the cost of living, invests in the just transition that we all apparently believe in, and secures economic recovery. And yet, Labour, Tory and Lib Dem spokespeople couldn't start talking about the Constitution fast enough in their remarks. And that's why we are setting the budget and why they are still, after 15 years, still opposing it. The rhetoric today suggests they'll be opposing it for another few years yet. But on to the substance, presiding officer. Kenny Gibson uh, started with the comments from, on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee, talking about uh, the additional funding and the need for transparency. And again, to put on record, uh, we expect the UK government to finalise our budget in the coming weeks. And until then, we are proceeding on the basis of uh, personal indications and meetings with the Chief Secretary and on the basis of communications with Treasury officials um, of where our budget might end up this year. And I've chosen to prioritise funding out of those additional flexibilities for local government. Of course, last week, in fact, just yesterday, everybody in this chamber was calling on me to do precisely that. Yet I imagine most will still vote against it eh, at 5pm today, which sums up the opposition that we have. Yes, yes. Presiding officer, many members talked about priorities, and I agree that this is a budget of choices. Choices are, by their very nature, hard. So let's look at some of these choices. Douglas Lumsden talked, and I think quite rightly, about frontline nurses. So let's talk about our frontline nurses, who under this government are paid over £1,000 more per annum than they are under Douglas Lumsden's party. So there are some choices. Jackie Bailey talked about social care, and I agree with where she wants to end up. But we're delivering. It's not just rhetoric. We are delivering increases. And I think to dismiss it as 48p is a complete disservice to the value of the wage increase to social carers 
which is the equivalent of £3,000 per annum if you compare the £10.50 per hour to the previous year's national minimum wage, which is what many carers in Wales under Labour and in England under the Conservatives are being paid right now. But there are other choices. It is a fact of parliamentary life that every member wants all budget lines to increase. Jackie Bailey wants at least another £1 billion on health. Tories want several hundred million pounds more on local government and rates relief and skills. And presumably they agree with the UK government that health consequentials should be passed on to health and social care. But in all the contributions, presiding officer, there are areas of agreement. I think all of us agree that our priority is recovery. And as Fiona Hislop said, it should be welcomed that Scotland exceeded the pre-pandemic GDP levels in terms of growth this uh, month in terms of the estimates. We need to build on that and it's I think a, a reflection on the resilience of our business communities, the resilience of our workers and the ability for the country to pull together in times of crisis. Well the challenges that we face right now require that same solidarity and that same commitment to hard choices and to our priorities. Our priorities sorry. We need all the tools that we can get to do that, particularly the fiscal tools. And, you know, those can be delivered through the fiscal framework review. There is an opportunity if, as Liz Smith says, and I agree with her on this, if, as Liz Smith says, both governments are willing to approach the review in good faith. I certainly will be approaching it in good faith. I think probably all parties agree on where there needs to be significant changes and I'll be meeting the Chief Secretary to the Treasury next week. And I hope that those conversations will be constructive and they will progress the discussion. Presiding Officer, this is just stage one. There are, would you believe it, more debates to come on the budget. And let's not lose sight in all of those debates on areas that we agree and areas that we disagree, that this budget delivers on some very key commitments. I'm always struck by Pam Duncan Glancy's uh, remarks and was struck again. And I recognise the importance of opposition and scrutiny to push us to go further. But next year's budget delivers on our commitment to double the Scottish child payment. There are others in the chamber that have talked about the need to focus on economic recovery. And next year's budget delivers the highest level of investment for our enterprise agencies since 2010. I think all members have seen the importance of our health and social care services over the last uh, few years and recognise the pressures that they are dealing with right now. And next year's budget delivers record levels of investment in health and social care. Presiding officer, I have talked about this budget being a transitional budget. It's a budget for one year, but where we really want to end up is in a position where we can set multi-year budgets where our commitment to reform, our commitment to improving outcomes, our commitment to delivering tangible benefits to the people of Scotland are delivered because we can set multi-year budgets. That opportunity is one that we have now as a result of the UK Government's comprehensive spending review, and we are now in the process of a resource spending review. Yeah. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving away. The principle of setting multi-year budgets is about recognising things like the spend to save principle. Does she not recognise that an investment in social care, an uplift, a meaningful uplift in social care pay, is the sort of investment that will actually see us reduce delayed discharge and the massive cost that means to the public purse? Cabinet Secretary. I do agree with the principle, and, and that's precisely why I think we can't just dismiss the choices that we've made when it comes to, for example, the increase in wages. But I would also set this challenge down that for preventative spend to work, you have to be willing to move budgets. It's not that there's additional budget, for example, to uh, invest in social care and isolation. For us to really deliver preventative spend, we all need to have a far more mature debate when it comes to budget lines because it will require for some lines to go up, other lines to go down. So if we want to move more budget into social care, which I know is something that Jackie Bailey believes in, then it will need to come from other parts of the budget. And, and in a parliamentary context where we only believe budgets should go up, that makes it very difficult. So I think in terms of the resource spending review, we do have an opportunity. 
We have a commitment to consult as widely as possible because it does need to be Scotland's uh, budget and we will publish that in May after uh, the consultation which is running just now concludes and uh, we have an opportunity to set those. So, Presiding Officer, as I come to a conclusion, there are many challenges that we face. This is a transitional budget that backs Scotland's key priorities. I hope the opposition can vote for it at 5pm. That concludes the debate on Budget Scotland Bill and it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 2964 on committee meeting times. And I ask George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. The question on this motion will be put at decision time and I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now. And I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. I, President Officer, I think I will move that one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And the question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Therefore, there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that Amendment 2949.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend Motion 2949 in the name of Kate Forbes on Budget Scotland Bill, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Therefore, we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.